Hello, my name is Keshwani. It's K E S H W A N I Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must go through all the problems from this book. If there is any problem that gives you difficulty, you will find the solutions to the problem from day number 251 through 400. We have almost finished doing all the problems from this book. The problems that appear in this book happen to be the exact same problem in most cases and in most cases on the same exact page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original solutions tend to be lengthier and they tend to be a little bit in depth. Right now we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are still a big, big chunk of the exam. They have not gone away in the revised GRE, they are still there. Unfortunately in the new books they do not provide us enough practice questions for quantitative comparison questions. For that reason, starting from day number 401, we started solving some quantitative comparison questions out of this book and we are right now on page number 227, the GRE General Test, the 10th edition. Let's take a look at it. We are on page number 227, problem number 6, the very first problem that you see there in the second column. Problem number 6. 74% of people, 74% of people had no trouble with it. Here's the problem. 1 minus 1 over 7 versus 1 minus 1 over 8. The very first thing we need to do is find the common denominator. We can write this one as 7 over 7 minus 1 over 7. And we can write that one as 8 over 8 minus 1 over 8. That was a simple part. Once we have done that part, then we have 7 minus 1 which is 6, 6 over 7 versus 8 minus 1 is 7, 7 over 8. Now this is where this is where the tricky part comes in. How do you compare fractions? Very straightforward, very simple. Your job should be to get rid of this denominator as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. How do we get rid of this 7? It's very simple. Multiply both columns by 7. Multiply both columns by 7 and now the 7 has gone away. 7 disappears. We still have to get rid of this 8 from this side. How do we do that? Again, multiply both columns by 8. Multiply both columns by 8. When you do that, this 8 disappears. And what are we left with? We are left with 6 or 6 times 6 times 8, which is 48. 6 is a 48. And 7 times 7, which is 49. 49 is bigger than 48. The answer is B. Do you understand? Now I'm going to show you a quicker way. Now I'm going to show you a quicker way to compare the fractions, to compare the fractions. The quicker way is this. We had 6 over 7 versus 7 over 8. The quicker way, instead of doing, instead of showing all the steps here, if you don't want to show all the steps and if you want to save a couple of seconds, this is what you do. Take your 8, take the bottom number, multiply it by the top number. 8 times 6, 8 times 6, you see, which is what we had here, 8 times 6, and then take your bottom number, multiply it by the top number, and 7 times 7, which is exactly what we had here. So that's, that's just a quicker way to save you a couple of seconds. So that was it. Let's move on to number 7. Question number 7. Now, if you like, actually, we could actually do this problem in a little bit different way. Let's, let's do the same problem. Let's do the same problem in a little bit different way, shall we? A little bit differently, just, just for the hell of it, just for learning purposes. What we are about to do is nothing earth-shattering, do you understand? Just a little, a little different way of doing it. Are you ready? Let's begin. We see a 1 here, we see a 1 here, let's subtract 1 from both columns. If you subtract 1 from both columns, it disappears, that's it, it's gone. So what we're comparing is 1 over negative 1 over 7 versus negative 1 over 8. An exact same thing will apply as before. Watch what happens. Multiply both columns by 7, multiply both columns by 7 so that the 7 goes away. Multiply both columns by 8, multiply both columns by 8 so that the 8 goes away. And what are we left with here? Here we are left with negative 1 times 8. Negative 1 times 8 is negative 8. And here we are left with negative 1 times 7, which is negative 7. And of course, negative 7 is greater than negative 8. The answer is B. 
Of course, the answer is not going to change. The answer is what it is. But that's just a different way of looking at it. Let's do number seven. Number seven. Number seven is a word problem. I will have to write everything on the blackboard, otherwise it won't make any sense to you, so just be patient. Number seven. Seventy percent of the people got it right. Three tenths of the people missed it. We are told that Jim, oh for Christ's sake. We are told that Jim is three years older than Jonathan. Jim, we are told, is three years older than Jonathan. You see how annoying they are? They, why couldn't they use two people with two different uh, first letters so we could just use the first letter for their name? We are told that Myra is five years older than Melissa. Again, you see Melissa, M and M. It's very annoying. They go on to say, let's say Jonathan. Jonathan is two years older than Melissa. And they want us to compare Jim's age, column A, versus column B. They want us to compare. Myra's age. Let's see what we can do here. Let's see what we can do here. The simplest, quickest, the most economical way to tackle this problem is to simply plug in numbers here. Don't try to do it algebraically. You're going to be sitting there making equations. It'll be sheer waste of time. Nobody's going to give you extra credit for it. You understand? Just plug in numbers. Now, when you're plugging in numbers, when you when you're plugging in numbers, just don't go gung ho from the from the very first sentence. Don't just go gung ho. You have to read the whole thing. You have to understand the whole thing. And then you have to arrive at the conclusion as to where the story begins. It builds from the bottom up. It does not build from the top down. So where, does, where is the connection part? They tell us Melissa is two years older than Jonathan. Melissa is two years older than Jonathan. Actually, now that I think about it, in this case it wouldn't matter. Let's, let's just start from here. And if it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't work. When you start plugging in numbers and you find out halfway through that you made a boo-boo and when you started from the top it doesn't work, it doesn't build very nicely. At that point you realize that you have to start from the other end. I'm just going to start from here. Plug in a number for Jim, any number that you want. I'm going to pretend Jim is 10 years old. I'm going to pretend that Jim is 10 years old. Jim, we are told, is 3 years older than Jonathan. If Jim is 10 and he is 3 years older than Jonathan, Jonathan has to be 7. They go on to tell us that Jonathan is two years older than Melissa. Jonathan, we know, is seven. Jonathan is seven. That does not change. And Jonathan, we are told, is two years older than Melissa. That means Melissa must be five. That means Melissa must be five. Where is Melissa? Right here. She's Melissa. Melissa is five. And then they go on to tell us that Maria, Myra, whatever, however you pronounce it, Ma Myra is five years older than Melissa. Myra is five years older than Melissa, Melissa who is five years old, and this lady is five years older than Mel Melissa, so she must be ten. That's it, we're done. Jim's age, we started out with ten. Myra's age, we found out, is also ten. The answer is C. Answer to the problem is C. Let's go on then, number eight. Question number eight. I just realized that I did it again. I did not give you a chance to pause and unpause the video. I did not give you a chance to solve it yourself. If I forget to do that, you have to do it on your own. As soon as I finish setting up the problem, pause the video immediately, solve the problem yourself. As I have always reminded you, you will learn more that way. And then compare your work against the work that we do together. Do you understand? Don't keep watching the solutions. Uh, that's not how we learn. Number eight. 61% of the people had no trouble with it. Here's the question. Number eight. We're given, it's a geometry question and we're given a diagram here that looks something like this. R, S and T 
we are told, and the question is, here is column A, column A, which is S to T plus T to R versus column B, which we are told is R to S. Column A, column B. Pause the video, do the problem yourself, and then once you have done it, you can resume the video and compare the work. Do you understand? I'll give you five seconds to do just that. Very good. There was your time to pause and unpause. What is this question dealing with? This question is dealing with a simple notion. And just, pay, just be patient. We are going someplace with it. Okay. A simple notion that this question is dealing with, which is, what is a triangle? If somebody were to come up to you and ask you this simple, straightforward question. Simple, straightforward question. What is a triangle? Will you be able to articulate, will you be able to provide an intuitive answer to it? Not a mechanical answer. Don't tell me it's three lines coming together with the sum of the angles being 180. That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear the intuitive explanation, intuitive uh, articulation of what a triangle is. What is a triangle? Do you know? A triangle, a triangle is, a triangle a triangle is nothing but a detour between two points. It's nothing but a detour between two points. Instead of going from R to S directly, instead of going R to S directly, uh, that was one choice I had. I could have gone R to S directly, I could have driven R to S directly. But I, but I decided to take a detour. I stopped at T first, and then I went to S. That's all it is. That's a triangle. A triangle is nothing but a detour between two points. And detour, keep listening, a detour by definition will always be longer than the direct route. Detour, I don't know why I'm writing all this thing now. This is too simple. Detour will always be longer than the direct route. Of course it's going to be longer than a direct route. That's why the bloody thing is called a detour. A direct route is a direct route. Direct route is shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. I don't know who said it. I think it was Einstein who said it. I don't remember who said it. But that's what it is. Shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. Now the question is this. The question is how do we say this thing? How do we say this part? How do we say this part? detour will always be longer than the direct route. How do we say this statement in the language of mathematics? How do mathematicians speak? How do mathematicians speak? The same thing in the language of mathematics, if you want to say, this is how we say it. This, in the language of mathematics we say, the sum of two sides of a triangle is always, is always greater than the than the third side. One more time. What this says is that detour will always be longer than the direct route. Detour is going from R to T and then from T to S. The same thing is said here in the language of mathematics. What it says is that the sum, S-U-M sum, of two sides of a triangle. What kind of triangle? What kind of triangle? It does not need to be any particular triangle. It does not need to be a right angle triangle. It does not need to be a, an acute triangle or obtuse triangle or a isosceles triangle or a equilateral triangle. It could be any triangle. The sum of two sides of a triangle, of a triangle, there is my triangle outside, of a triangle is always, is always greater than the third side. And that's what it is. The reason why the percentage is so low here, only 61% of people got, got this question right, is because they forgot what these questions are called, which is why I always make a point of putting it down on top to remind you what these questions are about. These questions are called quantitative comparison. Nobody's asking us to compute anything, which is why we write down the word computation and we cross it out for emphasis. The 40% of people who missed it, they're sitting there and saying, well, how can I, how can I figure out the, 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 the distances that is nothing given to us? And they sit there and put down answer choice D. There, nothing needs to be done. The sum of the two sides, S to T, 
S to T, S, you see, S T, which is this part right here, S T plus T R, T to R, sum of the two sides is always the sum of the two sides, sum of the two sides, right here, the sum of the two sides, sum of the two sides of a triangle is always greater than the third side. Voila! That's your third side. This is the third side, which is the direct route. This is the direct route, and therefore the sum of the two sides, any two sides, the other two sides, the sum of the two sides represents the detour from the two points direct route. That's all. Sum of the two sides is always greater than the third side. That's all it is. We don't need to know what these sides are. The direct route will always be shorter. That's all. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.